Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is life illuminated. By Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan. Acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians, a Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome back to Access to Democracy. Alan Miller with you, and we have a return guest who's wearing a different hat, uh, actually Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, Paul Thiessen has not been here since he was in the legislature, where he held numerous positions, including speaker, including minority leader, including legislator. And he's now the young kid on the block in the Supreme Court. So. Uh, yes, that's uh, right. Although there is one justice that is in age younger than me, and, and she's very, she likes people to know that. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you were appointed by uh, Governor Dayton in 2018. So we'll talk about acclimating to the court. Yeah. But also you were appointed to fill out the term of a retiring justice. And as a result, you are up for election, which is not unknown to you because you've been through a lot of elections this year in 2020. But you're in a very different situation in this election. So let's talk about that. Uh, and then we'll talk about getting used to the court, et cetera. Yeah. But uh, number one, do you like the fact that you have to run for office again? Uh, well, you know, I don't know if anybody, you know, would choose to, would choose to run for election um, in a sense. Uh, but I actually do like, like it for two reasons. Um, one of the things, uh, I, you know, I love this job. I think it's uh, the best job that I've, I've ever had. Um, uh, but it is a little bit isolating. And one thing about elections is it gives you an opportunity to go out and talk to Minnesotans. And I think uh, that part of it is something I'm looking forward to. We've already started doing a little bit of that. Uh, so you have and, to campaign again. Campaign, right, and talk to them about, you know, what they, it's a different kind of campaigning. You know, you're not talking about the issues you talk about in a typical political legislative or presidential race. Uh, you're talking about the justice system and kind of how you approach uh, that, but also listening to people's concerns about how the justice system works in their lives, uh, and trying to think hard about uh, about what those issues are. You know, one of the things that I've learned about this job is, you know, we decide cases, uh, but the Supreme Court also has administrative responsibility for the court system, and so there's lots of uh, things on that side of of the job of being a Supreme Court justice that I think are very worth um, discussion in a, in a political campaign. Um, and then the other thing is I do think that there's something valuable about um, having elected judges. You know, there's benefits to lifetime appointment, you know, the insulation That's from the political process. That's one of the questions process. I was going to yeah. ask you, yeah. Um, you know, that you, you're insulated from the political process uh, and there's some benefit to that. And I think, but I think that the way elections for judicial campaigns are run in Minnesota, uh, con you know, in, in contrast to some other even nearby states like Wisconsin, is that our races have not gotten politicized. They've not become partisan. I think that's when elections get dangerous for judges. But uh, Minnesota, like so many other things, has handled our elections very well. And it doesn't get a situation where you have judges that you know were appointed a generation ago 
and are dealing with issues that are, you know, changed over the course of a well, generation. There are a couple things about Minnesota. One of the things I don't like and that I lobbied against unsuccessfully was the fact that judges have to retire at 70. Mm -hmm. In my experience and <clears throat> coming from New York years ago, judges could be renewed every two years up to 76 after passing a competency test. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that 70 really uh, is the old 50 or um, vice versa. I think the judge at 80, obviously in my case, uh, 80 is just a kid, uh, <laughs> is very capable of giving his best years to the court then, and I, I don't like that system. But you're in a situation now where you have to campaign. I guess you have to raise money for your campaign. I guess probably that money comes from lawyers, some of whom then appear before the court, and that's always been uh, a subject of criticism. And I don't like that aspect of it. Uh, and, you know, it's troublesome. Well, you know, on the, on the retirement age, that was, you know, that's set by the legislature. And right. it's, it, um, that's within their, dis certainly within their discretion to change. Although, you know, I would agree with you that there are plenty of judges who are fully um, doing, do a great job at Some 70. Some retired and would, judges. And who would be doing as good Paul a job Anderson, at 71. Paul Anderson, Alan yes. Page. Yeah. Uh, who are so. doing incredible things today, and they and they're off the court. Yeah. Uh, they could still be on the court because okay. if they were, you you might not be here so. in the court. No, I mean that's uh, there. So the, I think you're right about that, uh, but that's up to the legislature to decide. Um, but this the um, as to the issue of the the campaigning and the you know what it places on a judge. You know, it's, it's just something that you have to be very cognizant about. And it's, um, uh, you know, first of all, in the money, um, you do have to, we, you know, the campaigns do have to raise money to communicate with voters. Right. Um, but we do have rules in Minnesota. I think it's important for people to know that I am actually not allowed to ask for money. Other people have to ask on my behalf. There has to be a campaign a camp in your behalf. Right. right. And, um, and I can't know who gives to me. So I have no access. Uh, I have no access to the to the people that are actually giving to the campaign, and so um, that is at least a little bit of insulation from the pressure you're talking about there, you know. And then judges have to deal with you know those types of issues a lot. I mean, it's a it's um it's an important part of how I go about thinking about this job is making sure that I step away from you know I don't think the influence of money is significant, but you come to the court. Uh, you know, with certain, you know, ideas about how things should operate. And one of the things you have to do with the judge, as a judge, is, you know, set those things aside and give a fair hearing to everybody. And, and so we take that very seriously, and I take that very seriously. We've been very lucky in the Supreme Court of Minnesota uh, with both the quality and character of the justices that we have had. Mm -hmm. uh, being low man on the totem pole, so to speak, uh, is that a peculiar position for you, or does it have any additional responsibilities? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, there are some, uh, I mean, there's some minor additional responsibilities, like, you know, I'm the person that knocks on the door before we go into court, and when we have our conferences, I put out <clears throat> all the coasters and collect all the coasters when we're done meeting, so things like that. Um, but in terms of the um, of the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is, you know, seven equal people going into a room and, and sharing their ideas. And I found it um, incredibly collegial, and I found it incredibly valuable and comforting in the sense that um, when you're working on a decision on some tough issues, getting the input uh, and getting seven other people on board, or at least four of the seven on board, gives you comfort that you're not going too far off on some kind of a tangent, right? Uh, and so I found the experience uh, to be great that people uh, listen to everybody's opinions and I listen to their opinions. Um, so I've not felt that being new on the court has impacted uh, me from that perspective. Now sometimes it gets pretty heated in the way judges, justices see cases. Uh, does that carry over beyond the conference? I, I mean, again, I think it's actually a very collegial court, and the people that were there before me, the six justices that have been on, worked. I have worked very hard to s establish that culture. 
uh, and it's, it's certainly, I think, continued. Uh, we do have our disagreements. There's no question about it. And, um, and sometimes, you know, those can be very strongly held opinions. Uh, but I also, just, I, just to reiterate, I think everybody in the court, uh, as we've gotten to know each other, as I've gotten to know everybody, I mean, everybody respects the other people, respects the experiences that they bring to the court, because we all come with a different variety of experiences. Uh, and I think it makes for better decision making. Now, one of my favorite people, in addition to an individual who I think was a great justice, is Paul Anderson. Mm -hmm. and well, I agree <clears throat> with you. He's a wonderful guy. And talking to him, he said, uh, what makes a, a decision for us possible is knowing the facts, knowing all the facts. He says, that's what makes a good decision. It's not the law necessarily. We follow the law, but we have to know the facts. And of course, I think about that in terms of what's going on nationally right now, and I don't want to ask you about it nor uh, get your opinion on it, uh, because I don't think you would give I it anyway. I wouldn't give it to you, yes. <laughs> but uh, we, we have heard people saying, show us the facts, show us the evidence, show us the witnesses. And I do think that that's what makes it possible to have a good decision and not just what's in the statute books. Well, I think what you just said and what Justice Anderson said is, is very wise. And it's actually something I have, um, I've actually learned more and more over the 18 months that I've been on the court. Uh, you know, because I did start more often uh, starting with the law and trying to understand, you know, <clears throat> what do these cases say and what does, in principle, that mean for this case. <coughs> but increasingly, uh, I have found that the, the key is really to dig in and understand the facts of the case, because that then does give you the direction you need to go. Excuse me. Now, <coughs> I don't normally lose a guest, but... Uh, I'm not going to. So... <coughs> so We've had a lot of attacks on the justice system in this society now, uh, both federally and even in, within the states. Uh, do people really understand the separation of powers and what the judges do, what the justice system what does, as opposed to the executive and uh, et cetera, the legislative, and then the judicial? Well, I mean, I do, I would say, you know, both in my time as a legislator and as a judge, I do think that there's kind of a civic deficit in this country, uh, people understanding how things operate. Um, but I also think that uh, explaining that uh, and making sure people do understand that is one of the responsibilities that the court does have. Uh, why shows like this are, and being able to come on shows like this are so great. Um, and, you know, so I spend a lot of time going out to talk to high school classes, uh, some college classes, uh, and, and community events. Uh, and a lot of it is spent just ex educating people on what the court does, uh, how we make our decisions, how we decide whether or not to take a case as the Supreme Court, what's the difference between a trial court, you know, where they're actually trying those facts and determining what they are, and appellate courts that are kind of more reviewing the law. Um, all of those things, I think, are important for people to, to understand. And, you know, and then as a, as a former legislator, it's, it actually, it's, it's kind of a, it's been an interesting experience and, um, and thing to think about for me about how does the role of the legislature, which is to enact the law, as opposed to the judiciary, which is to try to interpret what the legislature meant when there's a dispute about what they meant. I mean, that's what our job really is. Uh, you know, making sure that we're always coming back to, at the end of the day, what did the legislature really mean? Because legislature is the democratically elected body. And actually, there are times when the legislature is not sure what it meant. Well, where we have ambiguities in, in law, and that falls I have to, to the judges <laughs> to determine. I have to say, I've been um, I've been embarrassed a number of times at reading some of the stuff that com has come out of the legislature, even while I was there. Uh, that was not as clear as yeah. it. And sometimes that's intentional, right? You know, to pass a law, sometimes leaving that ambiguity gets more votes. But then it ends up... With us, with, yes. With the court. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's right. And now, another thing about being in the Supreme Court, you get, on a given day, 
you may have a technical case, you may have a murder case, you may have a case involving bonds and, and finances and things like that. So how do you deal with having to have knowledge in such a wide area so that when you get on the bench, you're prepared uh, it's, it's a hot court. You've seen the, the material ahead of time. Right. And, uh, you know, have expertise to ask the right questions to get a just solution. Well, I think the, the, the most important part of that is, uh, you know, that the parties themselves, uh, the lawyers for each side, you know, file briefs with us and, and prepare the materials. And we also have the benefit, typically, of well, we always have the benefit of at least one judge who's looked at the case before. And in most cases, not just the trial judge, but the Court of Appeals. So we have the benefit of their expertise, too. Uh, so it's a lot of reading. I mean, that's a lot of what it comes down to. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, you know, second part of it is, you know, spending the time. And this is part of the job. I love. One of the things I love about the job is you actually do have time to think. Uh, instead of politics, you're always reacting to stuff. Um, is to, to, to kind of really dig in and, and build up the expertise. So most of my time is spent reading and writing, you know, and, th and thinking about, uh, you know, what these cases mean. And the third thing is, you know, you do bring uh, your experiences with you, you know. So, um, you know, in the past I've, I've had, you know, and aside from the legislature, which actually has brought me, I, I, you know, those experiences and the understandings I've had having to deal with a lot of issues over there, have paid off on the court because it, you know I've had some feel or touch on what these issues are about, uh, but my legal practice was also quite varied before I came on the court. You know, so I was a public defender and I worked uh, at two kind of large law firms in in Minneapolis, uh, dealing with a whole variety of issues. And so, um, so that has also served me well, I think. Do you have law clerks? And we have law clerks. Yes, I should have. Do you have individual clerks, or uh, are there a pool of clerks that well, work we have, with the judges? We have, well, two or three things depending. I have one law clerk that works just with me in my chambers, and then I share another law clerk with Barry Anderson, with one of the other justices. So we each have one and a half law clerks in a sense. Uh, but then we have a commissioner's office of um, six people. And uh, they are permanent staff. Like the law department, so to speak? Yeah, and so they will do some of this. So they're a, a, a tremendous resource uh, as well to go and, and talk to about cases. And they have expertise kind of individually in a, in a variety of, of, of areas. And these are not partisan people. These are really dedicated public servants. Oh, absolutely, yes. Quite the opposite of partisan. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's your biggest surprise since joining the court? Um, you know, I think the biggest surprise for me was this, all the, uh, the kind of the administrative part of the job, the overseeing of the justice system, you know. So I kind of knew that I was going to be deciding cases, and I had a feel for that, and a feel partly from being on legislative committees for a long time, what oral argument would be like. So that part uh, hasn't been as surprising to me, but, you know, each justice, for instance, is a liaison to one of the judicial districts or two. Uh, you know, so the one that I'm a liaison to is out centered in Wilmer and kind of west central Minnesota. So spending a lot of time going out there, talking to people, and making sure that the voices of those district court judges are heard in our discussions. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm responsible for a, a number, like the, the rules of evidence, you know. So when we make changes to the rules of evidence, I'm the liaison to that committee of, you know, really dedicated people who work very hard to make sure we're keeping up to date. Uh, and then we have other projects. I'm um, working uh, right now on a project to allow paralegals or paraprofessionals to do a little bit more what may be considered legal work in areas where we have a shortage of lawyers, like eviction cases, some family law cases. So there's a lot of things kind of outside the deciding of cases. There's a big move yeah. in, in law schools also that they should cut it down to two years of in-school work and one year of, in effect, interning. Yeah, uh, and a lot of law schools are doing, I mean, even our local law schools are doing more and more of that where the, the, with clinics and other things. You know, in fact, uh, we have, uh, Justice McKaig and I, um, have two externs or residents uh, from William Mitchell every semester, and they're working with us instead of going to school during their, one of the semesters of their third year. 
uh, to kind of get that practical experience. And they've been great help to, to me. Invaluable experience for them. And great for them. And for you yeah, as well. It's mutually beneficial. So, yeah. so uh, now we are going to lose a giant on the Minnesota Supreme Court in Justice Lillehog who for health reasons is going to retire yeah. shortly. Uh, and I know he's been very influential, not only to you, but to the, the court itself. So uh, I'm it's, looking to you yeah. to become the new Justice well, Lillehog, okay. who's one of my favorite people. Well, he is, he, it's gonna be a, a, a huge loss to the court. I'm, you know, cause he, he does bring all of the things that you want uh, in a judge, you know, he brings, I mean, first of all, he's incredibly smart. He has a great legal mind. He can really think through problems down to their, their core, which is really what you want to do, um, in, you know, especially in this job. Um, but he has a wonderful demeanor. He's a great mentor to people. Uh, he has compassion that he brings to the job. Uh, and he's had a wide breadth of experience that we benefit from on the court all the time. So everything you, you know, you want in a in a judge or you think of this is what an ideal judge would be, he's that. And, and those, uh, yeah. those are the things that the governor, you think, should be looking for in a replacement to him. Yeah, and no, I, know, I do think we, that's I right. mean, we have lost giants on the court because Judge Anderson had to retire and, uh, and as we mentioned. Yeah, you know. so no, it'll be a big loss uh, in, um, and you know, so I mean, he 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 won't be able to be replaced. But um, you know, we'll, uh, I'm sure the next justice is going to be great, but uh, he will really be missed. And uh, so the governor should look for somebody who is what compassionate. Well, has compassion, intelligence. Uh, that's really really important. Uh, you know, I think um, experience in a why in a variety of areas of the law. You know, so you can bring that that breadth of experience. Um, you know, Justice Lillehog and I are the two that came, you know, directly from practice or from, you know, not from the court. Uh, and I, and um, so someone, I, I, having another judge, you know, having another, someone who's currently a judge appointed would be fine, but making sure that someone has had experience practicing law, I think, is, is something that's important as well. Now, uh... I don't want to talk, well, I do want to talk politics, but I know we're not going to talk politics. Uh, but uh, certainly I, I think what we're seeing on a national level is not being held up for the example that we would want our children to follow. I think what they should follow is something like Minnesota. Uh, one of the things where I think the schools are short is we don't teach the social sciences anymore. We're so into uh, intellectual technology and artificial intelligence and all these things, which are fine, but we don't teach humanities. We don't teach the so social sciences. We don't teach civics and history. And in my experience, and I taught for a lot of years, uh, the, the students are deficient in those areas simply because they haven't been exposed to them. Yeah, well, I mean, I and I don't uh, have as you know, I don't can't speak directly to what's what people are being educated on right now. But I will say, kind of, well, what has as we discussed a little bit ago, um, I do think that making sure that civics is taught in our schools and, and and kids are exposed to how our government works and how it's supposed to work and what a good discourse looks like, a good debate looks like. Uh, is something incredibly important, and and I do think that that uh, that we aren't as a society doing as good a job on that as we should be. Now I have noticed lately that there have been a bunch more decisions in which uh, Justice Thiessen is the lead or the person who wrote the decision, and I guess that goes with having now been grounded in and spent some time in. For instance, we have uh, Minnesota versus the Minnesota School of Business, a yes. decision that was written by you, and I think for a unanimous court, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there might have been, I can't remember, I, but it was, uh, it, was a, it was a solid majority. There might have been a dissent or two, yeah. Consumer fraud, marketing. Yeah, it came out of the um, you know, Minnesota School of Business 
was uh, it's not closed now, but they had marketed a law for you know a degree that they were offering that would allow you to become a police officer. Uh, and it turns out that what they were offering didn't allow you to become a police officer. At least that's what the district court found. So that's kind of the finding of fact. Uh, and they and marketed all those it. And students couldn't get jobs afterwards, could, right. even though they had the degree from them, because they still didn't have the prerequisites. They didn't have the qualifications. And so, really, what we said in that case was that in a in a big consumer fraud uh, case that affects a lot of people, uh, that's and then where the attorney general is trying to to um, to enforce and to make sure those people's rights are restored and the, you know they get their money back um, that the standard of proof you know you can rely on things other than direct you know that this student thought he was going to get this degree and relied on those representations and then it turns out they weren't that that reliance is a little bit looser and so it gives the attorney general more power I think um, to make sure that consumers are being protected and that was the result of the case uh, based on some of our prior case law and, and, um, and the statute. And there are other cases like uh, Avis uh, budget rental uh, versus what is the county of Hennepin, where there are split decisions. Yeah. And you were what they call part of the split decision. You say you affirm in part and you dissent in part and some other justices affirm in part and dissent in part. And one really has to stretch to see how many judges came up with the majority decision, the four of, of the seven, and what parts are dissented. Is that, is that confusing? Or is that a difficult uh, type of a case to get involved in? Well, I mean, it's, um, I mean, I, we, we are, I think, unanimous in about 70% of our cases. Uh, and so in the other 30 percent, uh, there are some dissenting opinions. Those are the fun ones. And, those are, well, and sometimes <laughs> those are the fun ones. And, you know, and I actually think, you know, there, there's a, a school of thought that says, you know, we should work toward unanimity all the time. Uh, and I think it's important that we try to figure out something that can get people on board. On the other hand, I don't think it's uh, that bad to have kind of competing ideas uh, out there before the public, before the legislature, too, to kind of decide what they think you know the the ultimate decision should be and I also think that sometimes if you try to move too hard to consensus you lose the principle <coughs> right that's important for the case yeah. and um, and I think sometimes making sure that the principle is clear of the majority and of the dissent but the majority is what's going to guide us in the future and having that principle clear is easier for people in the future to understand what the rule is and having clear stable rules is is really the part of our job that's most important there's much more i wanted to talk to you about and i hope you'll come back oh i'd uh, love to yeah. sometime you know in, in a few months and before the election and uh, we'll talk further but we've been talking with associate justice paul Thiessen and uh, of the minnesota supreme court his first time back since he's on the court and good luck to you and thanks so much oh, for coming good to in. see you again okay. thanks